Thank you again for joining us today. This is our second installment of the training in evangelization where I'm actually going to give you an idea of what to say when you go up to someone's door and knock on their door and proper procedures. I've learned from experience that uh, knocking on someone's door is invading their free time and their free space and I'm going to respect their privacy. Uh, for one thing, I'm not going to walk across their yard. I'm not going to talk to their children and engage their children. Uh, I'm also going to stop at the fence if there's a beware of dog sign. Uh, I don't want to tempt uh, fate or tempt God and do anything that's foolish. Also, if there's a sign that says keep out, I'm going to respect that. There's privacy laws that I definitely do not want to break any laws because we are first, as it says in Romans 13, we are subject to those in authority over us and uh, also the governing laws of the land. Saying that, I want to just go over a few things. First of all, for this, I went out before with three people before, and it seems to me it's a little intimidating to go with three people. One is a little underwhelming at times, but it's a it's not as intimidating. One is not the perhaps best practice. Two people, I believe, is the best practice. I would say that I had the uh, the our church elder's wife offer to go with me, but since she is married and I'm married and we're not to each other. Uh, I don't believe in mixing couples. Uh, you can uh, probably better off having people that are uh, not married to each other. I think you want to be above reproach at all times. Saying that, let me say first of all that when you do go out, you're going to want to pray uh, pray the night before. In fact, pray the week before if you can. Try to pick a time for the Holy Spirit to go before you to show you what to say, when to say it, and make divine appointments for you that week. The evangelism training I gave you with earlier last week has what the way of the Master and using the Ten Commandments. I'll go over other ways that you can introduce the Gospel to people in other ways that may not be exactly like that. I want to leave you open to the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit going before you and with you is pretty much going to be done in vain. There is the power from Christ that He's promised in Acts 1 8. He will send the Spirit with you, but if you don't pray about it at first and go in all humbleness and humility, earnestly seeking to reach the lost for Christ, not building up church membership, not filling up the pews, not trying to draw people away from their churches to your church, but trying to reach people that are lost and will be separated from God forever. One of the things that I want to stress also are the website evangelismunlimited.org. Evangelismunlimited.org is a website that provides free PDF files for you to use. They're easy to download and it uh, shows the plan of salvation using scriptures from the Word of God. It talks about Calvary and it shows the cross and that uh, Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father in heaven in the one and only way. It shows the plan of salvation and it presents the gospel. And it's uh, got it also in the lower right hand corner a place where you can put your church's name, address, and phone number. It's in a small section because they want to emphasize the plan of salvation. We're at to evangelize the world. We're told to go into all the world to make disciples of all nations. When you do that, you can sometimes it's right down in your neighborhood, your next door neighbor, and your family and friends, and we'll discuss ways that you can speak with someone. It's actually harder to witness to your best friends and your family than it is a complete stranger. We'll find out why a little bit later. One of the first things I do too is I have a map that I have made and I try to not duplicate areas that I don't want to go over the same areas again. I pray about where I should go and I pray before I go that the Holy Spirit would prepare hearts, would minimize distractions and that would go with us and empower us to speak the words that we need to speak and to the proper person at the time we need to say them. I won't always use the same words, I won't always use the same plan of salvation in introducing the gospel to Jesus Christ because I want to be open to the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit uh, lead and guide and direct my words and my direction and my witnessing. Saying that I want to first of all tell you that I will never cross across someone's yard. Uh, I will never of course hop a fence. I will try to avoid 
walking across someone's driveway even. I try to stay on the sidewalk where at all possible and I would always try to go with another person if, if at all possible. Many times I end up going by myself and hopefully you could send out two at a time. That's the best practice in my opinion. There's a person that can go with you, be praying with you and pray as you go. Prayer walk is something that some people do before they go to the house and then they come back around. Uh, anyway, I do take a, the plan of salvation with me and I have them ready to hand out and I also have a rubber band available in case they're not home and then I take it and then I just fold it up like this and then I'll fold it up and then put it put a rubber band around the door handle and if there's a way that you can just loop it into the door handle with a like a storm door you can stick it in there and it will stay. I try to secure it well because sometimes the winds will try to blow them away and if I see someone on the street walking by I stop and engage and uh, I would tell them who I am. I wouldn't necessarily tell them I'm the pastor, but I'd tell them uh, where I'm from, that which church I'm from, and we're out trying to meet the community and uh, try to reach people and tell them about Jesus and introduce them to the Master. So, having said that, we are praying the night before, we're praying the morning of, and we're praying as we go, and when we go, we absolutely do not go into, again, an area that uh, where there seems to be danger imminent. I've had a few dogs chase me. I've actually had a cat chase me too before. And the thing is just if that ever happens, just you're supposed to back up and walk backwards slowly. Yeah, I would never turn around and run. Uh, you've seen the movie Run Forest Run. Uh, don't try that at home. That's not a very good plan. Anyway, so when you go to the fence, I would like you to or if there's no fence, walk up the sidewalk with the other person and then first thing you do is ring the doorbell one time and wait maybe 15-20 seconds. Ring the doorbell again. A lot of times you can tell they're going to know you're there. If the doorbell rings and you hear dogs, which is very frequent, they know you're there. They'll be coming so there's no need to knock. But if you ring the doorbell a second time and still no one answers, it may indicate there's no one home may indicate the doorbell doesn't work. Then I try to knock one time, medium loud. I don't pound on the door like I'm the, I'm the police and I have a warrant. You know, I just knock on the door and make sure it's loud enough for them to hear. If no answer, I knock one more time and right after I knock the second time, I put the flyer into their uh, the screen door window or the handle or if there's a place that I can put it in there and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave that on there and I'm going to just leave the property right away. And I'm going to pray as I leave that that plan of salvation, the Word of God, Isaiah 55, 11 says, the Word of God has a power effect. It will not return void and without effect. So I'm claiming that promise that God's Word will not return void. And I know God's, uh, His Word is inerrant. It's infallible. And it's without error. So we know it's going to be have an effect in some ways, even if it doesn't convict that person. Again, the part thing is that the power is in the message that is not in the messenger. It's not in the flyer. It's in the Word of God. And that is up to the Holy Spirit to convict them and to open their mind to the, the Word of God and let it penetrate into the stony heart and hopefully penetrate into make it a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit does the work there. Another thing is too that Jesus actually during the when you cast nets, he told uh, Peter, the fisherman, they told him to cast nets even though these men had been fishing all night he said cast your nets over here and they caught such a catch they could hardly take it into the boat the boat almost sank and it's a miracle the nets didn't tear the point is Jesus is, is in charge of this he is doing the catching the Holy Spirit does the convicting and the Father does the drawing and John 6.44 says so it's not your responsibility it is their response to his ability. You're being a faithful witness and you're just being obedient to the Great Commission. I'm so happy that you are interested in evangelizing because for many, uh, I wrote a book on this to try to motivate people called The Great Omission. What I'm trying to do is motivate people to take it to heart, take the imperative command of the Great Commission given five times by Jesus Christ to go into all the world. 
Now, let's say someone answers the door, and when they answer the door, I first of all want to say I, I'm really apologize. I'm sorry for interrupting your Saturday morning or whatever time it was. Let me say that at first here that Saturday mornings is about the most efficient time for me to go because I, I work my work schedule and a lot of times if you're going to go on a weekday night you're going to probably catch parents that have children who have homework they're eating supper maybe from 6 to 8 is a good time in the evening but they've also got to have their baths and people have a busy lifestyle at home on a work night especially Monday early in the week is not a good time we've found from experience most people are not very open to any company and they really don't have any time so saying that let me say this that we have found that Saturday mornings from 10 a.m. until about 1 p.m. is optimally the best time most people are home regardless if they work second or third shift most people will be at home at that time so you're not going to have any problems with catching most people there at home and I don't try to go anywhere anytime before 930 optimally the best time I think my experience has been 10 o'clock 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. you can go at other times certainly most likely uh, Sundays again that's a day of rest for most people they might take it as intrusion but uh, you can do maybe you have a better time and place uh, in mind for you to go and uh, I would say pray about that talk to church leadership uh, I, from my own experience I have found that that's the best time Friday night is okay too but you're gonna miss a lot of people that go to uh, high school football games or basketball games uh, Friday nights a lot of people go out in the evenings and so you're gonna have a hard time Friday night would be a possibility but uh, you're gonna catch people in a little bit better mood too by the way so let's say that they did answer the door and the first thing you said is they said you want to say is I'm really sorry I'm infringing on your time Saturday morning please excuse me for that my name is Jack you can tell them your name I, I'm not getting into last names I tell them I'm Jack I would say I'm from the Mulvane Brethren Church we're going out to meet the community to see what we can do as a church to reach the community and help the community is there anything in particular now here's where our point is is there anything in particular that you think a church could do for you here's where someone might say to you I already attend another church and when they do say that you could say well I'm so glad you know Jesus Christ and they will either confirm that uh, or, or they will not give you they'll be non-responsive if they tell you they do know the Lord Jesus Christ it says well wonderful I'm glad that's the main thing that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are a born again believer and where do you attend church at and that's a chance for you to non-offensively inquire if they are attending another church and if they are that says I'm so glad Thank you for your time, and I appreciate that, and God bless. And then I, I go ahead and leave. I asked the person where they attend church because uh, the last numbers we had from the Barna Group was only 17% of born-again believers of evangelical Christians attend church on a regular basis. 17%. Uh, that's a very startling number to me. Uh, it's very low. And if they don't attend a church, that's where you can absolutely welcome them to come worship with you. I would tell them our Sunday school is at 9.30. We have a Wednesday night Bible study at uh, 7 o'clock. And we also have Sunday morning worship services at 10.45. We'd certainly like to welcome you there. I also tell them we have a potluck dinner once, uh, once a month, the first Sunday of the month. And that's an open invitation for people to invite others outside of the, their church family maybe in their neighbors and their friends or co-workers maybe even family members to come and have a dinner with them at a potluck you don't have to invite him to church you'd be welcome to but if you just like to come to the potluck and get a free meal we'll have that around 12 o'clock on Sunday the first Sunday every month I don't want to pressure him to think well you have to come to church in order to get the free food that's kind of a, a deceptive practice in my attempt uh, if I tried to do that now if the person doesn't attend a church and they are not a Christian uh, that's where you can open up the possibility of either introducing the gospel there's other ways that we'll mention that I'll probably mention this next week with uh, Daryl Robinson wrote a book called uh, people sharing Jesus 
People Sharing Jesus is a wonderful book because it gives you an interesting idea that you can use from an acrostic or, or an acronym called FIRM. And FIRM is the F stands for do you have any family here in town? Do you have any, you know, you want to ask them about family? If you ask a person about their family, you're going to hold their attention and it's something that they're interested in and you're showing concern about them. Do you live here? Is your family from here? And it also introduces you to the fact that uh, opens up the idea that you're interested in them in an earnest way. And I want to do it sincerely too because that's what I said. We're going out to reach the community and meet the community and get to know our town or our city. So FIRM, the acronym FIRM, F stands for family. I in FIRM is like their, their interest. You know, I look for something in the yard. Sometimes, uh, one time I think I saw uh, like a sports sign for Green Bay Packers. I said, I see you like football. You're, I, I'm a football. I like the football. Uh, I like college football too. Depending on what I see in the yard, I kind of gather clues from that and I talk about things that interest them. It says, you know, I might, it helps me engage and open up conversation. And so, without pressuring them, I'm not cramming religion down their throat. Jesus was interested in developing relationships with people. He never tried to force himself on onto anybody. Uh, that's just not his way. So their interest, their ideas, and things like that that they uh, have an interest in. So that's firm, family, I, interest, like sports, uh, whatever that else might be. Maybe collecting, you know, maybe they have a, an old model carve in the back, you know, they. They have a road a roadster in the back, and you can tell that they like cars. And uh, so that's firm. F I R is religion. Now that's where you introduce. You're not introducing the gospel yet. Do you have any beliefs about interest in in religion? I mean, do you know anything about Jesus? What what would you say? Of, who do you think Jesus is? Uh, that's a way for them to. You're kind of analyzing what they're, you're making an analysis basically of, of what information they have about Jesus. Maybe they have misconceptions, maybe they already know about Jesus, and maybe they have other different practices. I've ran into a Buddhist, I've ran into uh, Islamists, uh, I've ran into Orthodox Jews. Uh, it's a way to find out their background and their interest. That way I know exactly how to approach them using the Word of God because there's actually we'll talk about later that the Bible that shows many ways that you can use the Word of God that uh, are effective means for reaching people from different faiths and different beliefs so that's family, F for family, I's for ideas or interests uh, R for religious beliefs and then M with the message the M is the message the gospel well you know, it's about Jesus Christ, and if you ever heard the fact that He has been crucified for us, that uh, that He came and lived a perfect life, and you, you, that's where you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, and don't let any set pattern of ideas in your mind try to memorize and go down and look at a card. Just leave room for the Holy Spirit to speak, because each person may need something a little bit different. There is no one-size-fits-all evangelism. I wish it were that easy, but there is not. All the ways that I've investigated over the years, I've trained with an evangelist. I've, I've went and trained other churches, talked to their outreach coordinators. Uh, there's just a lot of different ways, and the main thing is you have to be open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit does the work. And I don't ever want to limit the Holy Spirit, because then I'm taking over the place of the Holy Spirit, and, and uh, this is not my... I'm not doing the evangelism. This is evangelism. It comes from uh, the Holy Spirit and the power is in the message. And I'm just trying to be a faithful message. And at other times I might, if I didn't use the word firm, and if, and if it looks like they're, uh, my body, their body language says they're done, they want, they're getting ready to close the door, you offer to hand them a, the plan of salvation and give it to them and just show it to them right here. So would you like one of these? And if you'd like one of these, that's a pretty non-offensive way. Instead of saying, here, take this. Uh, here, would you like one of these? I leave that as a question because I don't want to force it down anyone's throat. I want to leave them with the idea that, yes, 
you know, it, they would want one. So it's totally up to them if they really want one or not. And if they say no, I'm not going to want to leave. I'm not going to attach one to their chain link fence, put one in the door handle. I would never attach anything to a mailbox. Don't ever put anything in a mailbox. Uh, that's a federal offense for one thing. And uh, if the person said no and then you still leave it on, out there outside somewhere, they're really going to be offended and you're going to probably drive a wedge between them and God. You don't want to do that. Also, I might say that if there's a, if there's a uh, children present, I'm not going to try to engage the children. I might say good morning. I might say hello. And then, but if they try to talk, I says, excuse me, and then I want to head and walk up the door. You don't want to engage children. If you're the parent there, or the grandparent, or foster parent, uh, you, you do not want someone talking to your children, would you? Someone you don't know. So I would definitely do not engage the children, even though that seems a bit rude. Uh, I would just go beyond the children. Anyway, at the very end I say, well, I thank you for your time, and I'm really sorry to take up your time. Have a good day. Take care, and whatever you want to say at the end. Again, I'm showing politeness. I'm not trying to force myself on them at all. So uh, that's kind of a natural approach, and I'll try to provide that in, in, in more detail perhaps later on a PowerPoint, maybe a handout that you can see. Uh, so, and, and if they do attend the church, I would say once again, it's not, uh, if they have a church that they do attend regularly, I'm celebrating with them, I'm happy for them, and, and I might say something, well, that's great. It's not where we worship, but it's who we worship. And... Uh, I'm not going to try to, well, we, we have a better church or that, that church I heard things about. No, we want to, we, we don't ever want to judge others for their beliefs. Uh, I might use, at other times, instead of firm, I might use, if, if that, their body language is showing that they're still open and they're receptive and they are not wanting to close the door, I'd say, let me ask you a question. Would you consider yourself a good person? I mean, most people here, I think, that I met have, have considered themselves a good person. And that's sadly the fact is that most people think they're a good person and they are good. They do good things and uh, they believe that they're going to heaven and they are so deceived that they just don't know yet. So that's where the WDJD, the way of the master, uh, do you think you're a good person using the Ten Commandments to let the Holy Spirit convict them? If you read Romans 1 and 2, the human conscience really has, a, there's a knowledge of God within the back of everybody's mind. And so, I'll read the body language, and if they're still open to more conversation, I would say that's where I would launch into the way of the Master. Uh, would you consider yourself a good person? And most people would say yes, and then of course then you would say, do you think you've kept the commandments? And the funny thing is, I did a survey a couple of years ago that more people could that know the different brands of beer then they know all of the commandments so you may have to remind them what some of the commandments are do you think you've ever told a lie uh, have you ever hated someone uh, have you ever stolen anything so those things are that's a way that you can use to let the Holy Spirit convict them Psalm 19:7 says the law of God is perfect converting the soul the law of God does convict and it's like a mirror, as James said, the royal law, it reflects our imperfections. Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. You remind, remind them that you could not do that either, but then uh, you can tell them, point them toward Jesus Christ. And based upon their breaking of the Ten Commandments, which everybody has done, uh, based upon that, and you were to meet God in the Judgment Day, would you think you were going to heaven or hell? And then they're going to think about that. And if they say, well, they, they think they're, they're be in trouble, they might have to go to hell, then you say, well, then that's when you direct them to Jesus Christ, that uh, the supreme sacrifice that he's blood of the Lamb of God has atoned for their sins and has paid their fine, paid the wrath of God has been placed on Jesus Christ so that we might have redemption through the blood of the Lamb of God. And if they still think they... The God is a good God and a good judge. He would. He was a good. He's full of love. Really, the greatest attribute of God is not mercy and love and grace. It is holiness. That is the single most greatest attribute of God. Is 
He is holy. And without sin, he cannot look at sin. And based upon that, you think, I keep directing them back to the Ten Commandments and then the holiness of God and his perfect righteous standards that no sin can enter into his presence. No man or woman can see him and live without having the, the atonement of Jesus Christ on the work of Calvary, the completed work that Jesus has done. Anyway, just remember that the worst job of witnessing that you do is better than the no job of witnessing at all. The sad fact is very few Christians have not only not led someone to Christ in their whole lifetime, they have not even shared the gospel with anyone outside of their own family. In fact, only I said one in ten have even shared their faith with another person, uh, and that is just tragic. There's also, uh, you know, I might say that if they do want to feel like they want to make a decision at that time, if they feel like they, they need, they, they are, they're coming to the point of, that they see the need of a Savior, I would say do not repeat the sinner's prayer. I just don't feel comfortable in leading someone, having someone repeat it. I think especially if, if it comes from the heart, let the Holy Spirit convict them. Uh, they... Well, I'm not going to hand them a decision card and have them fill it out. Now let's go get baptized. Uh, why don't you come down to our church and we'll accept you as membership. Uh, I just don't like the idea because believing in Jesus Christ is, and I'll go over this in a moment, is about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I'm going to go over the plan of salvation here in just a moment. In fact, one of my favorite uh, scriptures is that... Uh, well, I might say also, I don't really carry a Bible. I carry a satchel with me, and I might have a pocket Bible inside of that. But I try to memorize key scriptures. And, of course, my plan of salvation that I have on my sheet, uh, it's got, it has the plan of salvation on it. It has the scriptures on it. Uh, so I can refer to that right there. And if I have to, I might even say, well, Romans 10.9 says, and this is one of my favorites, Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And actually I'm reading Romans 10, 9 through 13 if you wanted that, but that's the Romans 10 verse 9 is one of my favorite ones. They believe in your heart. That does not mean that you're letting God fill you using a vacuum shape left for God into your heart. It is the heart is the way the uh, writers of the Bible describe the heart as the seat of the intellect. It's the the whole man and whole woman. It's a belief system that's systemic throughout the entire person's being. So we know the intellect is in the mind, but uh, so Romans 10.9, and then here you can say, well, if you want to believe in Jesus Christ, here's what Romans 10.9 says. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and of course he is Lord of those, only those if you obey him, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. So your belief in Jesus Christ, you lean upon him, you trust him, you rely upon him, that is, that is a salvation right there. Believing, it means trusting in, relying on, leaning upon. For anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. So Romans 10, verse 9 through 13 is absolutely wonderful because it ends like, with everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Another one I like is Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12 is real short. It's easy to memorize. Salvation is found in no one else. You know, there's a lot of religions, and I've heard people say, well, I know uh, Eckhart Tolle and Oprah Winfrey have this belief that there are many paths to God, and they believe that there's many ways around to heaven, but they try to end around Jesus Christ, and it's just not true. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's a narrow road. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ alone. Some people might say that, well, and I'm getting ready to wrap up here, 
There are many paths to God. I said, okay, fine. There are many paths to God. One leads to the great white throne judgment, and that's in Revelation 20. The other path is narrow and difficult, and it leads to eternal life, but it is only through Jesus Christ and no one else. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, there is no one else. There is no other way. Not any other name. Period. And finally with Acts 16.31, 31, I'm going to emphasize Acts 16.31. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You and your household. Let me close with that and give you a couple more. Romans 3.10, Romans 6.23, they call it the Roman road. Hebrews 9.27, but from my, my own personal taste, my own beliefs, Romans 10.9 through 13 is better than any sinner's prayer. It shows them the way to salvation is to declare with their mouth and a belief in their heart that Jesus Christ was born again and he was raised. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame and they will be raised with eternal life. So saying that, the next time I'll go over a little bit more detail and I'll actually show you some definite ways to approach someone in the mall, in the street, in the grocery store, somewhere, someone that you will be able to meet and, and even ways you can talk to your family and your co-workers and your next door neighbors and be a faithful witness for Jesus Christ. I thank God that you're interested in evangelism and obeyment, that being the great commission, the great commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose righteous name I give thanks for you. Amen.